there's a new microcontroller on the market, and this time it comes from Raspberry Pi. This is the new 2020 Raspberry Pi Pico. Now we all know Raspberry Pi being more of a computer than a microcontroller. But now with this new product, we have a programmable microcontroller, just as an Arduino Nano for example. But the Pico has a lot more speed, more memory, it is a dual-core microcontroller and best of all, it is a 32-bit ARM controller compared with the 8 bits of the Arduino Nano. So imagine the power. In this video, we will start programming this microcontroller in MicroPython. And in future episodes, we also start working with this in C++. I'll show you everything about this new board, compare it with the Arduino, install the coding software and show you some examples, from simple ones of an LED blinking, to ADC read and I2C communications, just as we do with an Arduino. So guys, let's get started. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. Go and check all their services. For PCB prototype from 1 up to 14 layers, order the SMD stencil which is used to solder SMD components, the PCB assembly where they will solder all the tiny components for you automatically using machines, also flexible PCBs up to 8 layers and their new services of 3D printing, injection molding, laser metal cutting and CNC milling of any 3D part of different metals. So code now on PCBWay.com. Upload the Gerber files, adjust the settings, and for only $5 you can get up to 10 PCBs of 10 by 10 cm. What's up my friends, welcome back. So this is the new Raspberry Pi Pico. So let's start with some specs. The board is using the RP2040 microcontroller designed by Raspberry Pi. This is an ARM Cortex-M0 dual-core processor with flexible clock speed up to 133 MHz. 133 MHz, compared with the Nano for example, that works at only 16 MHz, so imagine the speed difference. On side of that, this is a 32-bit microcontroller, so the data flow would be 4 times or more even faster compared with the Arduino boards which is an 8-bit controller. So for now we have dual-core, 133 MHz and 32-bit structure, compared with a single-core, 16 MHz and only 8-bit structure of the Atmega 328 of the Arduino. The chip has 264 kilobits of SRAM memory and 2 MB of flash memory, and it also has an ultra-low power slip mode. And by the way, this board operates at 3.3 volts and not 5 volts as the Arduino. Now as for the pinout. This board has 40 pins and from these 26 are multifunction GPIO ports. It also has two SPI ports and two I2C ports, and as you can see this could be programmed to be connected at any pin. It also has two UART ports and three ADCs. These ADC are 12 bits, which is 4 times better than the 10 bits ADC of the Arduino. It also has 16 controllable PWM channels, which we will test in a moment. As an extra this IC has an onboard temperature sensor, which we will also test later accelerated float libraries, and 8 programmable PIO, which I never used. So let's start. This microcontroller could be programmed in C++, which is pretty close to what the Arduino is using, but it could also be programmed in MicroPython, which is a compact version of the Python made for small microcontrollers. So today we will work in MicroPython, and on future episodes we will start with C++. To start with MicroPython we have 3 steps. First we install Tony, which is a programming environment that I will use, we add MicroPython to the board and then we see how to upload codes. Go to tani.org and download the software. In my case I'm using Windows, so I will download this one. Install the software and this will take just a couple of minutes. Now you can run Tony. At this moment connect your Pico board to the PC using the USB cable. So first thing first we go to Tools and select Options. And here in the Interpreter tab, you select MicroPython Raspberry Pi Pico. You can also select the CAM of your Pico board and click OK. If you don't already have MicroPython running on your Pico, when you click the Stop or the Play buttons, a prompt will automatically flash MicroPython on the Pico. If this process doesn't work, we go to this website. 
We click on the Getting Started, and here we download the MicroPython UF2 file. Once you have this file downloaded, you have to disconnect the Pico from the PC, and now you press the Boot button. While pressing this button, you can connect back the Pico to the USB cable. You will see that now it will appear on the PC as a new drive. All you have to do is to copy the UF2 file that you have just downloaded to this drive, and you will see that that will automatically disconnect and reboot. So now MicroPython is installed. So connect back the Pico and run Tony. Now click the stop button and as you can see, we are connected. To test if the connection works, in the shell tab, you can type something like print hello world and press enter. If hello world is printed, then we are good to go. So let's start with a code example. Let's make the most basic and blink an LED. The PCB has an onboard LED that is connected to GPIO25. So now create a new project and save it to your computer. Let's give it a name such as blink.py for example. In order to use the pins we import the pin from machine, and in order to create a delay we use timer. I define my LED as a pin for the GPIO25 and define it as an output. I also create a boolean LED state that is equal to true. I create my timer to blink each 1 Hz, so it will blink each 1 second. Now each time this timer ticks I will invert the LED state. And with the LED.value, I write that value to the LED where true is LED on and false is the LED off. Press the play button and the LED is now blinking. So that was pretty easy. Here I have another code that will blink two LEDs at the same time one on GPIO2 and another one let's say on GP20. As you can see this time I'm toggling the LEDs in an alternate mode. But wait a minute, if I disconnect the USB cable and plug it back in, as you can see the LED is not blinking anymore. Well, that's because we are running the Pi code from the PC. If you want your code to automatically run when you power the Raspberry Pico, you need to add that code to the microcontroller. So here is how. Let's create a new file. Click the save button and here select to save it to the Raspberry Pico. Now it's very important to name this file main.py. If you give it a different name, it won't run automatically, because the Pi is always looking for the main.p file. So now we can add our code. When I click the save button, the changes are saved to the main.py file that's on the microcontroller memory. So as you can see the LED is blinking. But now I remove the USB cable and connect it back on. And there you go. The LED is blinking automatically without me running it from the PC. Ok so now let's see more examples. How about using the ADCs? We have 12 bits ADCs on the GP26, 27 and 28. I define my ADC input connected at pin 28. To create the infinite loop I make a while true. And here all I do is to read the ADC value with the readU16 function. Then using print I can show the value on the shell monitor. I have a potentiometer that is connected to the GP28 pin. As you can see I rotate the potentiometer and the value goes from 0 to 65536 and that's weird because this is supposed to be a 12 bit ADC and not 16. Anyway that's how we can read analog values with this ADC on the Raspberry Pico. Now remember that the Pico has an onboard temperature sensor and that's connected on pin 4 and it has an analog output. So now if I make the same code but instead of using pin 28 I read the pin 4 and then I multiply this by the temperature multiplier, I get the temperature. As you can see I run this code and when I hit the PCB, the temperature rises. Now let's start with some I2C. We import from machine the I2C and the pin modules. To start an I2C port we use this line and we specify on which pins we want the SDA and the SCL, 
which in this case I place them on pins 8 and 9. Using the I2C.scan function, we can see if we have an I2C device connected. I connect my LCD to pins 8 and 9 for SDA and SCL. I run this code and as you can see on the monitor, I get that I found an I2C address, which in this case is 0x27, and that's correct. I now connect this I2C OLED display and run the same code. This time I found the address 0x3c, and that's also correct. So let's see how to control this OLED display using I2C communication. I connect ground and 3.3 volts from the Pico, and the SDA and the SCL pins to the GP8 and 9. Now in the code I need to use the SSD 1306 module, so I import that. I run this code and as you can see I get an error. There is no SSD 1306 module. And that's correct, because I don't have it. We have to add that to the Pi as well. So I found this module on the internet ready to use. So back in Tony create a new file. Save this file and select to save it on the Raspberry Pi Pico. Give this file the name ssd1306.py and click save. If we now go to open and select the Pico memory, as you can see, we have that file on the Raspberry Pi memory. Now go to the online code, which you can find below, and copy this code. Then we paste this to my file. Click the save button once again. Now go back to the main code and run it again. And there we go, we have no more errors, because now we have the SSD1306 library on the memory, so now we can use that. In the code I start a new SQC communication on those pins. I start the OLED display with this function from the used library. With the fill function we can set all the pixels to be on or off by adding a 0 or a 1. So to clear the entire display I make OLED.fill 0. With the OLED.text function we can send text. So add the text, the column and the row, and finally with the OLED.show we send the data to the display. Run the code and there you go. I have electronoops on my display. Ok so this time is the same code, but I've added the Raspberry Pi logo in hexadecimal file. We create it with this buffer and send it to the display on column 96 and row 0. And as you can see we now have that logo as well on the display. In the same way you can use this other display, which has the same chip but a different size. Now we could merge the ADC example with this OLED example. So all I have to do in the code is to take this ADC read and pass it to a string using the SRT declaration. I also add the round function so it won't print all the decimals, only two. To make the screen look cooler I also use the invert function so the text will be black. And this is the result. I now have the ADC read from the potentiometer on the display. Pretty nice, right? Finally, I have one more example, the PWM control. Remember that we have 16 pins that could create a PWM signal. So in the code I import the pin and the PWM from the machine module. I also import the U-time for creating delays. I attach the PWM to the pin 25, which is the pin of the onboard LED. I can set the frequency to 1000Hz. With the while true I can create my infinite loop, and inside here I can create two more whiles, and this will increase and decrease the PWM value. With PWM.duty I can write that value to a pin. And that's it. I run this code and as you can see we can now fade on and off the LED. Quite easy right? On the oscilloscope we can see the PWM signal increasing and decreasing at a constant frequency of 1 kHz. And here is me pushing a static PWM signal up to 9 MHz, but as you can see at this speed the shape is not square anymore. But anyway, a 9 MHz signal, that's a lot of speed. And programming this in C++, I think that we can get even more out of it. In a future episode I would like to share with you more examples and later start using this board with C++. Programming this in C++ is not that easy to start because we have multiple configurations that you must make before starting your codes and each time you want to flash a new code in C++. So now you know the basics about the Raspberry Pi Pico, 
how to install and use Tony, how to permanently upload the codes to the Pi in the main file, and how to run a few examples for Blink, PWM Fade, I2C OLED Display and ADC Read. I hope that you like this video and if so, give me a like. Thanks again and see you later guys. Hey guys, so that's the end of this video and I hope that you like it and the most important part is that you have learned something new. And as you know, part of the support for this channel comes from Patreon, so I would like to really thank you, thank you very much, I'll put the list for all my patrons here. And if you're not a patron and you would like to support me, you have all the links below. And also if you share this video, give it a like or comment below, that will help me to beat this YouTube algorithm. So thank you very much and see you in the next video.